Now that's yeah. why the discipline of simplicity, for example, yes. is a great, uh, actually frugality is the discipline, simplicity is the result, in a sense, of of the life. Well, but the way simplicity has been understood, right. it really is frugality. It you is. Know? It is. And it leads to a life where you get rid of the clutter mm. and, and you are able to have a unified purpose. Mm. And that means, among other things, you can throw stuff away. Yeah. I remember, I think it was William Penn used this wonderful phrase about letting go of cumber. Yes, yes. <laughs> and just, I mean, to think of a society where we have all these rental places where you put your junk. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I got to get, I got to rent another storage. Yeah, you've already got your bin. garage for it. <laughs> and what that, what that says about mm -hmm. the person, though, is mm -hmm. that means that they are inwardly in bondage. Yep, exactly. Because simplicity is an inward reality. That is, when that change comes about, the inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle free of cumber. You know, uh, it, 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 I guess the thing that you practice in simplicity most is letting things go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's actually trusting God. Yeah. And, and that's where the question, how has the practice of these disciplines mm -hmm. actually changed our lives? Mm -hmm. You and I, for example. Yes. It becomes real because it enables us to function well and to love God and love our neighbor. Absolutely I mean, that's right. where we grow. Absolutely right. I, uh, I more or less backed my way into the practice of disciplines before I knew, even knew the name. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, very concerned to preach in such a way that people would be converted. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that prayer was crucial to that. Mm -hmm. But as many ministers will tell you, uh, praying adequately is not easily in reach. And I didn't know anything about it, but I knew that I should try it. And I just happened upon some empty rooms in the college where Jane and I were at the time on the fourth floor of the Sunday School building of the church that was associated. And had these little chairs that are that mm -hmm. tall, you know. Yeah, right. And uh, no one could sit down in them. And so those rooms were empty all week. Mm -hmm. And I found that I could go in there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And just by, uh, I say I backed my way into I went in to pray. Uh -huh. But by staying, I was in solitude. Yep. And in silence. Yep. And I began to experience the effects of that, though I didn't know what it was. Yep. And then I learned that if you're going to pray, you have to be in a place to do that in your heart. It's, it's, it's so interesting because at a college I was teaching at, uh, they had this chapel building that was condemned. I mean, they ne needed to do renovations before it could be used. And so it, it really became for me a kind of private chapel. Yes. And I used it right. to walk around. Mm. It was about an 800 seat probably chapel. Mm. And uh, just pacing around, nobody, uh, nobody would ever come in there. Yes. So uh, that was one of the places where not having the money to renovate the place mm -hmm. helped me a great deal. Helped a great deal. <laughs> I was just talking to a college chaplain in the Midwest a few weeks ago, and he was telling about how he had just come to the end of himself mm -hmm. and found himself sitting on the front row of the empty chapel mm -hmm. for hours. Mm -hmm. And how that had put him in touch with God. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing that we don't have enough teaching. Mm -hmm. We have to more or less be driven to that before we find out. Now, of course, yeah. we've got some teaching now right. that things have changed in recent years. Right. And that's a really good thing. I think the local churches uh, have to come to grips with this. And right. especially, they need to understand that what we would call church as usual is not adequate for spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they need, we need to begin as pastors and leaders in the churches 
to not only, we, of course, we have to practice these things, mm -hmm. but begin to know our people well enough to lead them into the practices mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. to shepherd and teach them right. through the process. Because one of the uh, things that we were talking about earlier, the pitfalls, one of the main pitfalls is that people try once, it right. doesn't work, so they and they give up. Yeah, exactly. And that's where they need a teacher or a pastor or a friend to just step in and say, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You have to learn how to do it. Right. And you go through this and you go through that, and then they can begin to really tie into it. You know, I mean, if, uh, if uh, some of these great tennis players had quit after the first well, game that they played. Uh, yes, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, I think here, too, uh, grace has misled us uh, it, because the idea that it's grace means somehow you don't have to practice. Right, right. But you have to practice. Yeah. Period. Yeah. You have to practice pray. You have to practice solitude. You have to practice. <laughs> have to practice loving your neighbors yourself, <laughs> and then fixing why you couldn't do it. I remember the man coming out of the subway in New York and asking the uh, police officer how to get to Carnegie Hall. And his answer was, oh. practice, young man, practice. <laughs> <laughs>